Well, uh, the bankers have been very uh, infamous or unpopular of late, and Bob has decided to uh, talk about them. I don't know whether it's going to be some sort of defence, <laughs> uh, but it may well be. Over that, that was you, Bob. Certainly, we will get to bankers, but first, banking. we come via banking and a little um, uh, um, overture. Uh, libertarians are not like other folk, or shouldn't be. And libertarians shouldn't give a talk like other folk might, unless there are other libertarians. And even then. Uh, libertarians are a strange bunch, I hope. Most of them seem to be cosmopolitan, although in favour of localism, if that's the way you choose to live. Um, they can be lovers of a country or a land without being nationalists. They can be patriotic without thinking that their country right or wrong. They can choose to live somewhere without thinking it's because of the government is so enabling and so wonderful for them. In many ways, we are uh, the libertarians are akin to the, the best sort of socialist in the late 19th century, the, the, um, the whisking, whisking, um, wishing for a one world, um, opposed to uh, imperialism, pacifist, seeing no good in war, so seeing no good in poverty, but if you do, and of that sort, we are very much like, I think so. The libertarian sees no reason why that there can't be as many people as, as may be. They cannot see that other people are a, a burden to us or a, a threat to us. They are cosmopolitan. They, they believe in free trade, though you may not practice it. If you wish, you may attempt to live a, an isolated life. A Robinson Crusoe-like life, if you find that for aesthetic reasons or other reasons, you think this better, you can attempt it. You may, not, you may not, given the cost it will involve, you may not choose to go through with it, but at least you will have the right to do it. Uh, the trouble with the Pacific Socialists, or the Pacifist Socialists, is that some of them were class warriors, and some of them were not so nice. And some of them, some of them rather liked socialism because it allowed them to be socialists, and socialists were people who could lay into everyone else and tell them, what bad sorts they were, especially if they were richer and more intelligent. And that appealed to some. And once socialism was actually attempted, of course they hadn't really thought about the economics of it, it was just obvious that there were technical problems, how to make stuff, how to make it well, um, how to turn it out. Uh, but beyond that, since you're going to save on all these useless hands doing money, uh, banking work, money work, accountancy, all that kind of thing, police work, armed forces, you wouldn't need any of that. There was so much so much labour now turned directly to production and the best system of production, or you would hardly have to think about um, how to do things. There'll be technicians to tell you the best way to make anything. Now, of course, um, we know that that must run into trouble because of the economic calculation argument and the fact that uh, the fact that usually they're fighting a civil war first because nobody opts for um, nobody opts for socialism. And they may, they opt, may opt for a socialist party, but it doesn't actually try it on. Usually, it's just nationalising this or that or a matter of language and once it is seriously tried everything breaks down I mean the, the cities start to empty that's what happened under the Bolsheviks and the civil war was over this was now um, what they later called war communism but that was supposed to be communism and without the market system it was you couldn't sell to the country the country wouldn't sell to you so you went where the money was uh, where the food was so people started to leave the towns and they ended, but that, that wouldn't work in itself because even the countryside relied upon the towns for many things. And that would have led and did lead to, um, to horrors. Or might do if persisted with. As we know, Lenin brought, brought in the new economic policy, which was, of course, the old economic policy, whilst he was waiting for something, something better to do. And so the, so the socialists had to decide, these, these nice socialists, either you give it up. <laughs> Or you turn nasty, or let the nasty ones do what they have to do to maintain something that can be called socialism, or looks could be regarded as better, or you could fool yourself that it was better or would be better once the whole world joined in and you weren't surrounded by imperialist enemies or whatever it might be. But I fear that the soft ones would have been equally shoved off to the gulag, whilst the hard ones fought amongst themselves. So you can be a nice, you can be a nice. Socialist, but it, it doesn't lead to socialism. It being nasty doesn't either, but you have to give it up sooner if you're a decent sort. But libertarians can 
live in a libertarian order, and, and they can welcome the practice of what they, what they preach. So instead of diving into details, uh, Basel 1, 2, and 3, and such things, which will be spared to a great extent, if you're pleased to know, I thought I'd set it in the larger frame, larger framework. And the larger framework is one that welcomes and sees no problem with one money for all the world, one type of money. Might be gold, probably would be, if it wasn't prevented. It would be a common currency, not a single currency, certainly not a world government currency. We, we, we would expect it to emerge just in ordinary trade, having tried other things, usually silver and gold are converged upon. And gold is generally quite good. You can use them, you can use them both. It takes a government to ruin one or the other by reading the exchange ratio. So one has to be sent abroad or stuffed under the mattress or something. So the idea, which is now welcomed, indeed, it's almost thought to be better than a, a common currency for the world. Though some people who pine for world government might want that kind of thing. And of course, the euro is supposed to be something on the way, isn't it? No, otherwise they would have joined the dollar and saved all that nonsense and <laughs> got a much bigger sooner more monetary block. Of course, bleh, oh, that won't do, the dollar. Mm, mm. No, no, we're not. <laughs> they're not our kind of people at all. So they're not, they're not one-worlding, whereas well, well, the libertarian doesn't mind. A common currency is easily done. And yet, although in favour of a world system and thinking that's likely to come about, though not opposed to isolation of Certain, certain societies wish to practice it and allow people out if they wish to leave. Uh, we, we would expect there to be a, a, a world economy. Uh, but with localism, so we're sort of local cosmopolitans. Whether there will be 10,000 jurisdictions, I don't know. People sometimes think there might be or there should be, but it's, there's a lot of convenience in simply one, one area adopting the practices of the other. I believe in America, the uh, is it Delaware's company law is chosen by lots of states because it's such a good one. It's, it's a simple one. So they want us to agree to. So they, 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 everyone registers in Delaware, I believe, or many do. So something like that might happen. So there might be, although thinking of you know, think a thousand, ten thousand flowers bloom, that it might, it might not happen. But it wouldn't be a, a terrible thing uh, requiring any fighting to prevent it. However, so we have we can have a single money, there's no reason why not. We can have economic integration without any need for political subordination of the various areas. That's fine. So th th thus far, so, so normal, especially if you heard some of my earlier talks. Uh, now we get to banking. Now banking should be boring and investment should be interesting. We somehow seem to have muddled the two things up. Uh, banking in one sense, We'll get to the Rothbardian horrors later, or hand throwing in the air. Uh, banking could be, if it's simply a matter of paying debts and transferring monies, nothing to do with investment at all. You just keep your money there, you pay your bills, you transfer money from one part of the world to another. It doesn't matter what they're, whether it's called banking or not. You can't say, oh, that's not really banking. It's not. That's, that's, that's silly essentialism. Uh, investment is something else. Now, it so happens that banks of the kind that Rothbard disapproves, I'm actually, we might as well turn to him now, uh, the sort whereby you, they've got my money, but it's not there. Well, no, it's not there because they're making, they're making it work, which means they've invested it in various pockets all over the place. And if you all turn up to get it, you can't get it. But you knew that all along, didn't you, really? Or you should have been told, I suppose, that that might be an element of fraud, but apart from that, I, I can't get too excited about it. About fractional reserve, even. I mean, uh, I've, I've said in conversation, it doesn't matter, there's no bloody reserve. As long as your money's out there earning for you and given sufficient notice, uh, you can get your, um, your earnings and your capital back. I mean, there's no good objection to that. But what... That's that sort of bank. So we have the, an investment house and a, a mere transfer house. There's no reason why they can't be um, uh, libertarian through and through and purely commercial. But how do banks as we know them come along? Uh, well, that's a bit different. Because money as we would like it wasn't there for long. Actually, it was there for a long time. But the, the monarchs eventually um, 
got at it. I mean, some, some silver coins were unchanged for a thousand years. They were replaced, but the, it was the same weight, the same purity. A thousand years. Can't manage a thousand hours, I don't think, with this money of the same or similar purchasing power. But monarchs realised that um, if they could get legal tender, if they could make debts or taxes payable in units of something with a certain name, a certain name, this is the, this is the fatal turn. But Rothbard is actually rather good on this. He insists that the money unit should be a weight of something, of metal of a certain purity. That's what it is. And you refer to the weight or the mass. You can get different if you've got mountains. Very accurate scales. You can, diamonds, I believe, that try and find them at sea level and sort of sell them at another, or the other way around. You see the point. Uh, so we'd have, we'd have to make a distinction between mass and weight. But still, in all, for ordinary purposes, you don't need much of a distinction. But it's very important that contracts and debts are set out in weights of metal of a certain purity. That's the best way to do it. That way, that's what you have to get back, not something of the same name that's half the weight. Of course, the king has the army. So, you know, he's going to pay his debts in the little diddy coins with the same name. After all, the contract says so many things with my helmet of a certain name. That's what you're getting. You're not complaining, are you? And then they don't complain. Well, they might revolt, but they don't complain. So the king got in on the act. So money wasn't quite anymore what it could and should have been, and sometimes was. But the, that wasn't enough for the king. It wasn't enough to, um, to sweat the coins by jamming them in a bag to get the cold dust to rub off, or clipping the edges. That wasn't enough. He, he, he wanted more. So uh, apart from just simply going wholesale and halving, halving the weight and pulling the same thing, what else could he do? Well, he could tax. Yes, yes, you would have thought for a monarch or a, a democracy. Isn't that enough? I mean, no one else can tax. <laughs> no one else can tax. That should do the trick, you know. It's the public vote for you, don't they? Or they'll vote for the taxes, won't they? Well, yes, but they'll vote for me even more if I can, <laughs> if I can inflate, which is more difficult to do with um, metallic coins because they get so dizzy. So, of course, um, they, had to, they had to really wait for the note issue, but something else they could do was borrow. Borrow. So how are they going to borrow? Well, they can borrow off a bank, so they have to have banks, or invent banks, or license banks, especially if, they're, if they have the sort that will um, do what the monarch requires. So um, very early on, only 300 years, more. The Romans were at it. Oh, we have borrowing. Now, borrowing was not, not such a big deal because in those days you were borrowing real stuff, real coins. There's only so much borrowing can be done and you have to pay interest on it, which, which means having to tax, and that's not that's so popular. So we have, as in the modern age, a mixture of trying to do, um, depreciate the currency by foul means, so that wasn't, that wasn't too easy, but they could borrow and they could tax. And to do that, they, they like to have banks that were looked upon them with, with favour. To do that, you make the banks monopolies, if possible, or at least licensed, or the sort that only the sort that the monarch will work with, and others are not permitted to work with them. So that it makes them more amenable, and also they're getting a fair, um, a fair return for as long as you pay it, because of course you can pay the interest with, with money raised in tax. And this went on for many a year. But then, but then every now and then, as we're seeing with um, in the modern era, uh, there would be the repudiation of the debt. The thuggers would be told to thugger off. One could say, and uh, and that was that. They wouldn't get wouldn't get the money. But then, since you've repudiated the debt, we're now in a position to pay interest again. <laughs> so back they come, <laughs> the finger wabbling back to the flame. Because well, at least you, at least you're in a position to pay. You're not so strapped as you used to be. So, so they, they start lending you money again. So we have banks, we have metallic money. Sorry. Well, you know what happens next. Paper money. Paper money is even better. That you can depreciate rapidly and at will. Well, until the consequences are such that you'd rather wish you hadn't. 
However, back to Rothbard. And the complaint about, um, as you're probably all familiar with it, the idea that fractional reserve banks are essentially fraudulent and immoral and responsible for the horrors of inflation and other things. Now, they need not be, as I've said, that you could have no reserve at all. In one sense of a bank, that would be an investment house. If you're simply looking after your money a la warehouse and a shipping company, or transferring it by digital form, these days it would be, um, that's a different thing. So the fractional reserve, I think, is a, a bit of a, a side issue here. The truly objectionable thing is, and this is where the modern system of central bank, so we have the favoured banks, eventually one favoured bank, and that, as with the Bank of England, eventually be in effect becoming an arm of the state. It may be dressed up as something not like that, as the Fed is officially separate banks. It's, not, it, it's a private business, some complain. Well, it plainly isn't. It's an arm of the state in America. And that happened here. But the, the, to make it work, that had to have privileges that others didn't have. So that would either be the note issuer, or it became, as we know, the um, lender of last resort, the famous Bajotian term. Now, Badgett, it's been pointed out by um, Larry White and others, and George Soldier, didn't want a central bank. He thought it was the second best solution. He'd far rather have free banking. But he said, if you must have it, and you get into the sort of troubles that you probably will get with a central bank, trying to please the monarch or the government, then in that position, you must lend freely, or supply liquidity, as it's now known, or handfuls of cash, as we used to say. You must um, supply liquidity freely, but quite costly. So the bank, so the people who get issued and it's a last resort. They have to pay through the nose for it, so it has to be at a, a penal rate, but it has to be freely forthcoming, and they have to be solvent. So it's not something which just can't be helped by this. And I think in the, in the, recent, in the last 10 years, much, much liquidity has been given to banks that just were not solvent. And maybe slowly they're working their way there. Uh, we'll get to that. So the, the true objection is not so much fractional reserve, Again, um, Larry White and George Selgin and others, I think, have argued that providing that there's um, currency back with gold, or at least there's convertibility, as with the Scottish system, the amount of gold actually kept by the banks was down to about 2%. It was, only, it was in a sense, 2% was backing 100 was Doesn't sound right, but of course, people just didn't ask for the gold. They didn't carry the gold about. They used notes, or they, they used checks, or transfer from one account to another. That was the way they did it. But given that it was renewable in gold, and given that there was no central bank, and given that if any one bank started to um, issue loans too freely, then its gold would flood out to rival banks who would go through the clearing system and insist that no, we're, no, we won't just we want the we want the gold this time. And they have argued, I think it's fair enough, fair enough that you wouldn't get the system as we do with a central bank, which is that because of the national debt, which has been up there all this time, and indeed monetarists and Keynesians think it is a very good thing that there is a national debt and that there is a separate central bank and there are national monies, even though they're going up at rates that cannot be predicted, even though it is very awkward for producers and consumers in certain countries when they're currency revalues, devalues, or whatever. Even so, it, I, I suppose it must be argued for. But it's taken for granted that the costs in that regard are as nothing compared to the great advantages of having a managed money, a steered economy. In other words, they can use open market operations, for example. They can, in other words, you can have more money flooding into the system and money taken out of the system. And one one cures inflation, the other one cures deflation, and, and well, depreciation is taken care of all around because that's continual as far as we can see with surges. So the uh, 
purchasing power of the currency unit seems to go down and down, but that's not to be that's not thought to be a bad thing necessarily. In fact, if it goes too far, it's a bad thing. But provided the needs of business are encompassed by an elastic currency, and we are um, accommodating increased output by increased money supply, the idea is, um, we're all being greatly favoured and advantaged by this. I mean, it would be awful to just have a fixed money stock or a money stock that just happened to be that not growing very much it wasn't there wasn't much to get out of the ground anymore or the cost of getting out of the ground was such that it wasn't worth doing that is thought to be a terrible drag on an economy again not spelled out not explained why because it's it isn't, it isn't true and therefore it's difficult to explain how it's true <laughs> so they don't bother it's taken for granted that a managed a managed economy is a good one because we can you know I got the, there are jobs I've got there are PhDs that we don't question this stuff. It's everyone's doing it. How can it be wrong? Everyone's doing it. What are you, gonna, you crank? Of course you have a national money, an army, a tax, and dungeons, and secret police, and assassination squads, and torture chambers. That's what a modern well, a nation system. has to have. Unfortunate, in some regards. You are an anarchist. Being libertarians. So it's hardly argued for. It's simply taken for granted that national monies are a good thing. I mean, these are intelligent people. Better suits than I got. <coughs> Earning pots of money. How can they be wrong? Well, they're intelligent, and they're right insofar as they give the conventional response in the circumstances. They may have schools of economics, but they, they, learn, they learn the vocabulary. They can manipulate the tools. They can run their models. Um, anything but think about the workings of a market economy, as far as I can tell. They, they did rather do that. Instead, now they think, oh, how dare you, that's our way of thinking about a market economy. Well, yeah, it would be if it were so, but it, as it isn't, it ain't, said Humpty Dumpty, you know. And it's in the looking glass. So poor, poor sats like us, and not me alone, of course, because I've just read the books, but libertarians, the Austrian school is particularly good on this, though some of them are, of course, of course, so firm believers in um, national monies and the rest of the nonsense. Now, we are approaching part two, where it gets, it gets the sexy bit. So I don't think there's any problem with maintaining demand. If you permit production, free production, in fact, we insist on free production, <laughs> You ought to get no subsidy, you ought to get no captive customers, you are not to be paid to do nothing, then people get themselves producing the best way they know how. It's not optimum, it's never optimum, there's too much ignorance about for that. But it can get better and better, which is, which is better than optimum. I've argued before that we, we, we can do better than optimality. In other words, you can have um, the less efficient, more efficient system. So, uh, a cost can be got down or new products produced not in the best way they possibly could but because you're doing something better or more worth doing in a better way the output is of greater value or just greater, greater volume so um, you, you should be familiar with this the Austrian school does not see does, does not look for general equilibrium does not I think the general equilibrium theory or analysis of his only use. It's a shame we can't get the maths in for those who like to get the maths in because they look like they're proper scientists and social physicists. But if it can't be got in, it can't be got in, and that's all there is. So there we are. Now we're up to the modern age, God bless it, of permanent, dif permanent inflation, but irregular inflation, irregular both within the nation and between nations. At the same time, try to combine that with the free trade isn't easy. And I haven't yet got to, as every Austrian student must, uh, booms and busts. And bailouts, which is the sexy bit. This is, the, this is where the bankers make their appearance in person, as it were. Well, you all know the business cycle theory. Um, to keep demand up, to even be more accommodating to, um, to progress, the, the money's shut down, the money's pushed through. It keeps down the cost of surfacing the national debt, which is always useful. Uh, it cuts down in unemployment, very often it does, for a while, before in a general election. 
So you can see why it's popular. So we have the booms, but the, it, these things are unsustainable. The prices, the price differences between the assets required as inputs and the selling prices look fine to start with, but the mere effect of the flood of money that is required to keep down interest rates means that eventually the price structure will shift, the price differences between buying and selling costs. And so, for example, during the housing and say, office, office block boom, to start with, it's fine. You, the interest rates come down. Your asset prices are known. You start up. Things even look better and better. There's lots of office spots going up, but the predicted um, demand in the future is even higher. The rents are going up. Projected rents are going even higher. Interest rates haven't gone up yet. But eventually the time is reached when inflation is picking up. The currency might be getting into trouble on the foreign exchange markets because one country is inflating faster than another. Therefore, to save the pound, interest rates must go up. That makes things difficult for the producers who borrow to invest. Meanwhile, the inflationary effect of the money required to depress interest rates is, is now flooding out, and certain wages are going up. And if you won't increase the wages, you start talking about bottlenecks and shortages. Actually, even some Australian economists do this. It's just a bit silly. I mean, you can always get someone if you pay enough. What they mean is you cannot get the workers you want in a sufficiently low wage bill to make a profit out of it. I mean, they're there. It's not that there's a physical running out. Obviously, not all the things started perhaps can be easily finished, except by not doing other things. And since those other things might be more in demand or more profitable, then you can't, you can't get the office blocks all finished, which is why... In various parts of the world, Middle East, um, out in, out in uh, Nevada, some of these just just bulldozed or left left unfinished for a decade because it's not worth finishing them. Selling prices have collapsed. The costs have hardly gone down. If you bothered to finish it, so we've had our boom and now we have our bust. And should there be a bailout? Now, those who fear that growth cannot be accommodated without a growth in the money supply. They always like to call it supply because that's a, that suggests a supplier or plumbing, taps or sluices or valves and having to get, send it here and drag it there and pump it round. If you said individual money stocks, oh, is that it? Yeah, that's what it is. That's all there is to it. It's like, um, it's like the sock supply. Well, there's, there's some people have socks and they have them in the drawers, they have more socks than others, but that's it. it's just like that. That money's a little different. You do you do your um you do your exchanging with it. It's not barter unless, as I've said, it's a kind of two-way barter in and out of money. So, but there's a money supply, and of course, it's the government has a supply. And it has to be done at the right rate. And why is that? Well, to accommodate the growth, or to keep up demand, or maintain full employment. Why then the bailout? Why the why why the bailout? Well, don't you understand? This this fairy money that came from thin air and is a, sadly hacking back there rapidly must lead to a price collapse in prices. Many prices, and certainly the, the price level, so-called general price level, uh, may fall. And this is thought to be an awful thing. I don't know why it's an awful thing. For those who haven't got into debt and have saved, it's a rather good thing for them. House prices, houses are cheaper. Oh, shit, awful calamity that will never do. So we have to, we have to keep up the money. Again, rather like the um, why not one money? No, no, don't explain that. Oh, the, they might explain about efficient common currency areas. You know, it's a little bit of economics, economics that some people do. But the idea is of, of a practical common money, common money is not, not discussed. In the same way, it's hardly argued for why you can't have deflation. After all, deflation is, in the 19th century, was a fairly boring, standard thing. Prices of many goods fell. Fell, fell rapidly. Steep, the other ones not so much. Um, even, even workers may find themselves earning, in nominal terms, slightly less than their parents may have done, but what, they could buy so much more with it, and their savings are worth so much so much um, the value stored in the savings that, 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 that wasn't a problem. It wasn't, it wasn't, <coughs> it wasn't just Keynes. Um, Fisher was also, as many 
modern journalists, financial journalists are terrified about debt deflation. That means people owe a, no, a nominal sum, and if their income goes down because there's deflation, then they can't possibly pay off their debt. And that's no good thing. Um, but why do those who so fear money disappearing into nothing are so much in favour of money that can do that very thing? <laughs> this is not paradoxical. The sort of money that I'm, I favour can't disappear. It may, I mean, it doesn't have to be lumped around. One can simply transfer the, um, the ownership of money. You can have a note. Not with a promise, it's just that's your title, that's your deed. That shows that you own gold of a certain weight. You can even have little numbers put on the gold if you want. Modern machinery can do this. Such that that, that lump of gold is yours because it's your, your, your code number on it. Or your, whatever it might be, etched upon it. Anyway, that's a separate issue. But those who argue for um, the commodity currency are arguing for exactly the sort of money that cannot disappear. I used to argue, I still do a bit, I suppose, because I thought about it. But, um, why is everyone so worried with the downturn and the so-called financial crisis? It's actually a, an investment crisis that led to a financial crisis because banks were betting 35 to 1 on something that couldn't, couldn't possibly happen. And, and one in a million chance found out it was less than one in 35. Apparently. So they got into trouble. The bailout. That was the reason. We could, not, we could not allow a deflationary spiral. We couldn't allow debt deflation. Uh, wages are notoriously sticky, you know, as I've argued before. They're as sticky as you, <laughs> as you can make them, if you're a government. In themselves, they're not sticky at all. Ask, ask an actor. <laughs> they have to. <laughs> How much does it pay? All right, then. <laughs> they, they want to be an actor as well when they're not being a, a busboy, whatever that is, or a waiter. They, um, they hope for a good payday and sometimes they get one, but sometimes they get one. That's what they do. They get this, they get that. And many trades will be more akin to that. And all can be. You can, you can um, in a sense, forego higher wages by going for more certain and stable wages. And no doubt that would be a, a popular choice, both for the employee and the employer. That might, that might well happen. But the idea that people simply haven't got the sense to come in out of the rain, as I've said before, well, I think they have. And, if it, and they, would rather, um, they would rather work for less than starve. So, the, the, the cronyism, of course, is inescapable given the um, size of the modern state and the need for the bailout. The bailout wasn't just favoring banks, it was also the, it, it's combined with a stimulus. Now a stimulus is not something that stimulates, it's something that is called a stimulus. <laughs> Don't you understand? <coughs> That's what we've done, it's a stimulus. I see, I see. Mm -hmm. What would it look like, look like if it wasn't? Well, you know, very little growth in employment it might look like. Right? <laughs> um, and even then, even then, is it any wonder that people who want to get better wages than being on the dole, many of them will endeavour to find them? The fact that the tra tragedy is that having the dole makes it a far slower and a stickier operation to get people into jobs, but, but they do eventually find them. And uh, output picks up, and with it, demand. I mean, the demand is output. It's not spending money, it's making stuff. The money, you've got the money there, it can be the same amount of money as ever. The prices can adjust. The point is, even if the prices are always drifting down, the costs of making are always drifting even lower, and profits can be made. So don't worry about that. Get the prices right. People can be absorbed. However, even I don't think it's a very good idea to have um, a fiat currency and then suddenly lose half of it somewhere. This is not, but, but at least I argue for not having it in the first place. What we now have is people who say, how deplorable, how awful, Let's do it again. Get the interest rates down to minus two, whatever it now is, something of that kind. All of which based upon nothing stronger than a mere analogy. This this poor economy is on its deathbed, reclining. It can barely it can barely get down milk and milk and bread sops. What can we do? Well, put it in a 
a gentle regime and give it time, it'll come round, it'll come round. Little nil. Which, of course, is sim- it's a simple analogy and a daft one. That is not what an economy is like. Economy is like weeds. <laughs> Vigorous and growing, if it's permitted to be, if it's not poisoned or choked. If the water supply is cut off, and I don't mean the money's gone. So, th- again, hardly argued for. All sorts of, un- oh, God, unreadable stuff shoved out about what to do and why she would do it, why she, you should do it and how much and when and how and which. But never the idea that the system was self-balancing. Not automatic. It's not a machine. It's not organic either. It's the system adjusts because it, it's composed of selves who adjust themselves to the circumstances. And the circumstances don't rapidly change. The roads are where the roads are, the buildings are where the buildings are, the rivers are where the rivers are, mostly. Um, you have to make do with what there already is to make the stuff to sell tomorrow, so there's no reason why everything should suddenly lurch around unless there has been an unsustainable boom due to the use of credit and fiat currency, which, of course, libertarians don't argue for. As regards the cronyism, is this... um, this is rank hypocrisy. Is this uh, simple fraud, simple insiderism? Yeah, well, yes, yes, and yes, in part. But sadly, to do real damage, uh, you have to mean well. Um, and a lot of them do. A lot, a lot of these people, they, the, the middle, they go to the same sort of universities and they go to the same country clubs in America, perhaps. And uh, Yeah, yeah, they used to work for the same banking company. Yeah, yes, yes. Some of them are now in the in the establishment, the political establishment, some in the bureaucracy, but, but they, you know, we're all good, they're good guys. I went, to, I went to school with them. You know, they're basically good guys. They wish, they wish well for themselves and, and for the country, also, I suppose, and for the economy. They care a lot, but I suppose we're all as liable to it. Um, you care to be right, but you think you already are. So you rarely examine the arguments against your own position. You rarely go to the opposition to say, well, this is just fine, you know. No. Where are the Austrians? I know they're cranks, but let's see what they say. No, 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 no. You know, what, this is acceptable theory. It's confined. It's, there's cranky stuff out there. There's cranky stuff. There are cranky parties. The idea that the, 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 the central part, the centrists, the commonsensical, middle of the roads, are balmy, or at least as regards consequences of their policies. For example, all the things promised to the people, let alone state employees, but just to the people in general. The future pensions, the health care. Not funded, not funded, not there. And yet it's an extreme thing to say that it's it's all wrong, it's all out of shape, something's going to something must must give. That's thought to be weird. Not not the one party with two faces the, the in-and-out establishment part. That is not thought to be um, unsustainable and uh, basically mad. So I think there's a lot of group think. Though it's not a conspiracy, which sounds like the same thing, in a sense, I had to look it up. I thought, con, together, conspiracy, well, it must be something to do with um, spirit, this thought. But it's not, apparently it's common breathing, strangely enough. But it means they, they hug a mother, their heads together, it's part of a plot. No, I don't think most of these plots are open, honest, and nonetheless ruinous, but still, you know, they're not hiding it away. This is just sensible people doing, doing what everyone agrees is the right thing to maintain demand in the circumstances, as it may be, or preserve the financial system. The financial system. In my view, the financial system should be what people do with their money. That's the financial system. It's not something out standing over and above something or underneath supporting the whole thing. No, no. No, it's just people's savings, people's spendings, people's earnings. The very idea that somehow it's it's the money surging, the money pushing, the money propelling that makes the whole thing work. And that's the energy of it. No, no, no. It's, it's the human labour, the land, the capital plant, the ideas, of course, the methods even management methods. 
These are the things that turn it out. The idea that it's vitally important to have, and I hadn't got to this yet, though I've mentioned it in other, in other talks, the vital importance of aiding the economy by having investment. That's not too much saving. But you must have an awful lot of investment. This, 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 this is the acme of um, genius in economics. Uh, of course, it's impossible. It has to be, it has to be real saving. And pretty much that's going, to, that's going to mean money saving. You're saving in all other things as well. The idea that most things at any one time are in money. No, no. But the point is that additional savings have generally go through money. I mean, a man who works his own allotment may not bother to go to market, and yet he's doing a lot of saving because he's using, things to, using some of the crop to make next year's crop, and whatever it might be. But generally speaking, you're going to go through money. But at any one time, the amount of money that's waiting there to be used as savings or add to savings as is, is very little compared to what was previously money and has been turned into non-money, so in other words, capital, plant, equipment and the rest of it. So far too much attention is put upon the money anyway in that area. But suppose that it alone drives the system and fuels everything. It's, it's simply taken for granted, especially by bankers, because they would, they would assume that they're doing something vitally important. And yet, we find governments complaining that bankers are sitting on this money. You must know that. They've, got, they've been given all this money, or lent all this money, have all the reserves handed to them, next to nothing, even though they can then lend it to other people at a much higher rate. Therefore, it's not difficult to make money in those circumstances. They're sitting upon it, and it's, it's not turning the wheels of industry. Why is that? And the little businessman, and the medium-sized firms aren't taking on labour, and they're the best source of new employment, and there they are. Now, why isn't this happening? Well, for reasons that would stop it happening, even if the money was not not being turned out and handed over to them wholesale, it's back to the old problem of letting the price system work and not gluing it up with um, regulation and, uh, and warfare payments. Many um, libertarians, quite rightly, have said that this makes libertarianism look bad because of all this crony capitalism, all this corporatism, bailing out car companies. In America, they bailed out a car company and told the bondholders to go away because we're, doing, we're going to favour the union pension plan before we get to you, even though it was quite illegal. There is a legal uh, set of steps you have to go through to look after the, uh, the creditors, and they, Obama said he didn't bother to do it. Hey, I'm the president. It's good being president. Good being king. Um, so there is a great deal to be said against the undoubted um, cronyism and uh, capitalist cronyism at that. What do I think? Uh, before I get to what I think, what about regulation? Was it a failure of regulation? No, there's never been so much regulation of banks. The banks, I think, apart from nuclear power possibly, are the most regulated of all industries. So what went wrong? Well, you could be what went wrong was they were being told how to get it right. They were being told that these were safe bets. Um, if, you lend, if you lend in this area, say AAA rated. Um, mortgages. Mortgages are especially safe now. We've diced and sliced them. We have turned rubbish into, <laughs> into things smelling like a rose. You needn't worry about it. It's, it'll, it'll all work out. Well, it didn't. And the worst of it is, instead of leaving it to bankers to decide, they were uh, nudged by saying, well, you can lend even more out if it's AAA. It is, you have different ratios. You're allowed to, your reserves can be used for far more in the way of uh, loans if you, use, if you go for this. And sad, sad to relate. What, what, was, what, what was the safest thing of all? State debt, state debt, Greek debt. That was even safer. You could, any amount of that, any amount of that you could, you could lend out, you can do that. Do that then, that'll be good. That was the regulation for you. That was the regulation. Uh, I saw Basel 1, 2, and 3, it hardly matters. I, who's the best on this? He's in Nottingham. Do you know the one? Is it Nottingham? Kevin Dowd. Kevin Dowd. Yes, if you can, uh, I recommend look up his uh, 
his podcast on this. Although he's the only one who did get me to see that it may have been the case, as some argued, that the cash dispensers were about to run out of cash and something had to be done. The overnight market wasn't working into bank, into banks. That wasn't working either. Well, again, I come back to the point that we shouldn't have got in that position. And if that was something to deplore, then there have to be wholesale changes, not simply starting the whole process off again with more liquidity, low interest rates, increase the borrowing, applaud the house prices start to accelerate again. No. no. So if you, can, if you can search out his stuff. Now, he says he is so much not in favour of regulation, in the sense meant, bureaucratic regulation, legal constraints, the regulation should be competitors, fear of competitors, and um, your reputation, of course, but fear of losing your customers. And also, he, would, he goes so far as to say that banks should be partnerships, or at least there should be no limited liability. Not unlimited, but pretty, pretty steep. You may get to keep your house and some savings. But beyond that, the directors are they're responsible. And I think that would make them behave rather differently. Rather differently to the way they have. So Kevin Dowd is very good. He, you can find him on, um, just just look for MP3s or podcasts. Uh, he's on, um, from the Mises Institute, Cato, Reason, I think it's one there. Cobden Centre, they're all good. <coughs> I should, I should we'll stand up here. I really do. Because um, we're all very amiable, aren't we? Um, but there comes a point, and I've been watching this for when did this start? When did it go pear shaped? 2008. I was, and it was in August we started seeing prices move by 20%, was it? 20 or 30% in a day. And previously it had been 0.2 or what's or basis points we used to deal in, of course, in those days. But then suddenly 20%. And, um, and you're a little goggle-eyed, thinking something has gone wrong. Something has gone very wrong. Um, well, surely this will require a change of mind, or a change of heart, or a change of thought. But no, we find that um, financial ministers gather the various Weltführen I prefer to put it as a nasty association to the word. Uh, various world leaders gather, foregather, confer, promise yet more money creation, yet more borrowing, yet more credit. And there's nothing that they can't cure. I think they didn't cause, but there's nothing that they can't cure. And there comes a point, even in the gentle old soul's life, when there's a certain repugnance this, this is not adult. This is not decent. This is not honourable for you to carry on in such a way. You'll stay too long in this place. <laughs> yes, one gets quite Cromwellian, but of course that isn't the answer. I don't want a major general or a man on a white horse. But uh, there should be a, a feeling of revulsion that, no, 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 we don't want everyone to, to be doing this. It's the prom problem isn't that, that the Chinese have not yet got democracy or a a proper central bank or no 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 the whole schema is is wrong uh, you should think again or even once will be nice <laughs> thank you you send it up oh <laughs> Jan are you sure it was Humpty Dumpty? I thought it was Tweedledum and Tweedledee. Uh, Humpty Dumpty was a cat. Ah, uh, no, it was, it was Tweedledum and Tweedledee. Thank you. And contrary-wise, it ain't. You may recall. Yes. Any other questions? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Four? Yeah. Are there any... Ethnic or religious clues as to who to kidnaps. <laughs> <laughs> there's no conspiracy here. There's confederacy of dunces, but not, not much of a conspiracy. Um, one of the things that's uh, always puzzled me about the, uh, the Rothbardian conception right. of how the economy ought to work, I haven't found a satisfactory answer. 
uh, maybe you can supply all. But if you, um, if you imagine the Rothbard economy, which is a, a fixed supply of money, say, it car, needn't be, but it wouldn't do any harm if you no, let me just establish yeah. the parameters. Yeah, yeah sure. I'll sure. tell you what the problem is as I see it. Um, a, a fixed supply of money, or more or less fixed, which we have gold, generally the falling price is deflation. So um, the prices are falling, the value of your gold keeps going up. I can't see, and I think it's Christian that unless it's a problem, um, what would be the incentive to invest if simply holding money is going to keep making you richer? Um, it's not obvious to me what the incentive is to ever invest in anything if, if, uh, if just merely holding gold keeps making you richer because prices are always falling. And also, if, if you are lending it out, you would have to sort of... It seems to me you can't ask, you can't have half the economy on gold and lending it to the other half and expect it to get more back because there's only a fixed amount of gold. So, so the idea that you'll get a return on your investment, unless you have some incredibly complicated idea that you're prepared to accept less gold, less gold back, uh, but well, it would be sort of, you, you know, could have adjusted, adjusted for deflation. Or there could be. There could be. Is, why would you ever? There could be you, a negative interest rate. Yeah, but, but but why would you lend it? But merely holding gold would make you even richer. Could you make even more? Was the only answer. The rate would be higher. The, 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 the picture the price might be. I mean, the point is, would it be like this, the Rothbard economy? Would it be everything have to be calculated in reverse? And that is very counterintuitive to accept and a lot of the things like you say return on investment things like that there wouldn't be returns on investment you, you, you can't create this you know, there wouldn't be more gold you know, so. well it's a bit like arguing that people won't buy a computer because there'll be an even better one next year and it could even be cheaper next year but you do it's such, yeah, such, I, an, I know it's such an advantage to having one you will consume at some point yeah. Yeah, but, uh, and, and also um, well in the past, businesses did not go to banks. I even read somewhere that they have to borrow to meet the payroll. I mean, that can't, that can't be right on most firms. I mean, it's like paying the wages, providing you get a loan in time, doesn't sound like normal business to me. But you sometimes use that, you heard that expression. And in, in the past, many businesses simply, um, they, they got shareholders in, or they had partners, and they, or they ploughed uh, the profit back into the firm. There wasn't much, so much going to the bank. And there wouldn't need to be so much going to the bank, especially if, if banks were not allowed to create credit willy-nilly. Uh, credit should mean faith, probably get the word, faith that the person who's borrowed your real money will really give it back, or will give you back interest and then eventually the, the capital sum. It shouldn't mean uh, the creation of something called money in a greater amounts. Now, that's thought... And I'm, I, it still stuns me that people, are they really saying that turning out the money makes non-money more available? Like lathes and motors and canals. And, are they really saying that, that it makes it easier to... They can't be thinking that. And yet it seems that they are somehow thinking that it does. It does make for more investment if you just create credit money f from nothing. That seems strange. There is, only, there is one way it can work. One way. That is that savers get done, and there is forced saving. And those on fixed incomes get done, and those who are a bit slow in noticing if their workers get some way done. Yes, that, that could work, but it doesn't work two or three times in the same generation. It, people wise up. So, so the idea that it can be a permanent uh, boasted about and then publicly announced way of carrying on uh, that, that couldn't work but, but, but I suppose insofar as they're falling themselves and thinking that it and people don't notice perhaps there is a kind of way it can be a, a kind of false saying but it, no no it can't it can't and, and the distress caused by the booms and busts make it better off with a lower a lower rate of growth sustained steadily far better as far as people want growth and they seem to want it well they were acting ways that they get it and they don't complain so we assume they, they want growth. Christine? Actually, no. Oh. You, you've replied. Uh, oh. So, uh, oh, David? <laughs> yeah, uh, I don't know what the technical refutation to Paul's point uh, is, but it must be wrong because we had effectively a fixed gold money supply for the sort of best part of 50 years last part of the 19th century and the early part of the 20th century. <coughs> Throughout that period, we had positive 
interest rates. People didn't hold on to their gold, they did invest it, and production continued to increase. People got paid their interest. So there must be an answer. I, I, I just don't know what it is. No, I, mean, I, I can't find what it is. Rothbard makes it in one of his um, books. Um, if people um, choose to hoard gold, it doesn't matter. The value of gold will increase, it will have more deflation. It doesn't matter if the gold stock halved or half again. Mm. It, Providing that hoarding doesn't put other people out of work, and of course it's argued that it does, but it needn't if wages and prices are just. If someone chooses just to hoard their gold, what they're doing, they have the ability to compete with you for goods, and they're not. They're doing you a wonderful favour. It's, it's, not, it's not a bad thing. It would be better, perhaps, if... Well, actually, I'm not sure it would be better. The point is they're doing you no harm by not spending their savings. Their money, their money savings, because they are simply lower the price of things that you want to have. So those who do choose to invest can now buy more assets. Of course, it maybe if they both gone for it, we'd have the same number in different you know, different ownership. But still, it doesn't. It's no obvious harm. Yeah. Yeah, so, um, oh, I'm sure if you still want to talk? Yeah. So, I'm sure if you could clarify um, what you think fractional reserve banking is and what it contributes to the um, good and the cycle. Because you seem to be rather ambivalent in... Well, I think if, it, if, it's, if there's no state involved, if it's simply that banks, as a matter of practice, find they only need 2% two, 2 of the deposits available in instant gold. After all, they have all sorts of loans out and other assets that they can sell to get gold. So in time, everyone who wants gold, and you can even write it in and someone that did. Um, you may have to wait a month, or you may have to, maybe an upper limit on what you can take out in the short run. I, there are those who think it must be like the state. It must be as it must depreciate the currency as rapidly. Or, and I don't, I don't see that. I, I don't see the good in it. This is where I'm like your objection. I see no harm in an utterly fixed money stock or total of stocks. I see no harm in it. I don't see any wrong with if miners find it profitable to. To make bullion and minters make it uh, see it's profitable to turn that bullion into coin, but why they shouldn't? Well, I don't see that it's, it's desperately necessary either either way. So, um, although my objection to Seldon and White and others is that I don't see the need for the elasticity. They say, oh, they must. You, the system must respond to an increase in demand for money. Well, make do what there is is, is one is one response to an increase in demand. If there's an increasing demand for Rembrandts, we don't turn out fake Rembrandts, just, to, just the prices go up. People find, well, they do actually. <laughs> you have to be rather good at it. But uh, yeah, so once the price goes up, you find that people are not so keen on having a Rembrandt. So, in the same way, once, once the effect of people wanting more money, just for some reason they want, they want money, they want it to spend us and have money to hold. Well, there's usually a reason for this. A reason that would be absent in a, in a laissez-faire system, I think. So you wouldn't have to. There wouldn't be this sudden surges in demand for money to hold. Actually, and you wouldn't be he all this hedging against inflation. Actually. Yes. It occurs to me there wouldn't be any demand for all that. Yeah. So I, I, they, there are those. I forget his other name. I forget his name. But certainly, Sergeant and White think that there, mm -hmm. there will be a problem if we have to make the prices adjust. Why can't we just make the quantity of money adjust, even if it has to be paper money for a bit? Till the fuss is over, then it's settled yeah, down. I thought that as well. They're following high. Oh, hi, yeah, hi. Yeah, hi. I thought yes. that as well. It's funny how Austrians, when they think, when they have doubt about a the theory, they go towards Keynes and those wise. <laughs> Nicky. Yeah, Nicky. No, I, I just wanted to, to answer this. Uh, I think there's a fundamental flaw in this argument that people wouldn't spend their gold because the reason why price is going down is that people, because people make investments and the economy is more productive. As soon as everyone would hold their gold, prices would not go, go down, and therefore you wouldn't, you wouldn't have, a re, have a return on your, your, your gold investment, and then people would go out and, and, yes. and, and the first immediately person, start uh, yeah. spending their gold. So I mean, this, this, this whole argument is not logical because it assumes that the people are, are spending gold because that's the reason why my prices are going down. So it, it can maybe happen in short term. There yeah. But there's usually there's whatever. usually a reason for it. There's a reason for the pa there's a panic and there's a reason for the panic. Really. Yeah. And also, when when you want to have elastic money, then you must ask the fundamental question: Who is allowed to to 
print that money and to, mm. to, to spend it first. And, and the, the person who, who has this privilege uh, automatically has, a, has an enormous amount of power in its, in its hand and, and, and the system will, will, uh, will explode at some point. Yes, it's not safe, but luckily it's not necessary yeah. to have an accommodating currency. But that's what prices are for. They're the easiest thing to move, if you have to. Okay, you have to see the sense in it. Sometimes uh, workers may go on strike because they think they can get more. And they slowly eat up their savings and then they realise they were, they were fools. They shouldn't have done it. But sometimes it works. So in the same way, hanging back or rushing in. Well, but the idea that the whole system will suddenly lurch... If everyone tries to be in the same telephone box at the same time, it will be awful. Think of the slaughter, the suffocation. The, oh, they're not going to, are they? So it's a bit like that with what if everyone wants money all at once, as you say. The very people who are not holding out of the money, but actually turning it into machinery or fresh bread or whatever it might be, will be making super profits. And that will drag, all the, drag the money out of the savings again, or the hoardings. One of the David? Yeah, I think they are. I mean, certainly, I, I, I agree with... with what you say, Bob, about fractional reserve banking, that uh, I mean, you, you start from the proposition that a fixed supply of money is preferable to an elastic, changeable money stock of money that can be changed by somebody. So if that's a bad thing, it leads to misallocation, it leads to poops and busts, etc., etc. And as I understand it, the Austrian uh, objection to fractional uh, reserve banking is that it contributes to that process because it leads to a, a multiplication in the amount of money. And so that leads to booms and busts and misallocation. But it only does so if the reserve ratio changes. If the reserve ratio is fixed, yes, you have more money than you'd otherwise have, but it doesn't matter because it stays the same. It's not going to increase. And so you've got to say, well, what is going to cause a change in reserve ratio? And the answer to that is government. Because on a free market, if one bank tries to have a reserve ratio of a half percent, then it, what happens is exactly what you said. That bank gets a run, and either it goes bust or its reserve ratio. That's going to go. The problem with fractional reserve banking comes along when you have a government that can say, don't worry, lender of, run, lender of last resort, you can lend as much as you want, you can get out to point one percent will bail you out. That's when you get a process of an increase in money. But it's not a fractional reserve banking system alone that's the problem. On its own, yeah, I think it's actually harmless. I think it's in combination with government and central banks. It's not a, a, a better thing. It's not better. It's thing. harmless. It doesn't matter because of all. It means a larger yeah, yeah. but still relatively fixed money stock. And the amount of the stock doesn't matter as long as it doesn't change much. I'll have a first and Andrew second. Uh, I enjoyed your talk, Bob, thank you. And I'm particularly interested in the head, uh, not sure I had this idea of there being a conspiracy uh, of, of this going on. Did you agree that uh, there was a hidden hand in the free market? And in the same way, there's a hidden hand of the state, and people assume there must be something behind the scenes, and that behind the strings. Must be these conspiracies, and it turns into some sort of prison plan. But that this is just the inevitable consequence of statism. You, you have these various nations, people lobby government to introduce ID cards because they want to make money for their ID card company, not necessarily because they have a sort of grand scheme in their own. It must be said, when somebody who used to work at the same bank is now the governor, is now the uh, head of the Fed, and he gets 20 phone calls in one day from his ex-workmates who are in need of a bun, it, that looks dangerously close to her. But even there, even there he can say, yes, well, they would phone me because they are in trouble and I have to do something because it would hurt the economy. If I, it's, the, it's the group thing rather than the, rather than the conspiracy is. But people assume there must be something behind. Just that oh. the free market is just amazing. It just happens, and that's what's called a hidden hand. So they, there is a hidden hand of state. Oh, there's a sociology, but it's, it's, a, it's usually perverse. That's, that's our objection to it. Andrew? Uh, yeah. Um, I think that the issue with fractional reserve 
it's okay to say, yeah, if a <coughs> bank is very, the bank has been over extending itself, people are getting noticed and pull that money out, so the bank is going to do that. But it's actually very hard to tell, you know, who, you need to know who the bank has been lending to and for what and when, and that's kind of not obvious from outside. You have a very intrusive, or in some degree, through the, and it, it can happen in a moment, you know, you, you, can, you can make a big loan in a moment, but you shouldn't um, the, the history of the last yeah, 300 odd years of, uh, of, of, of frequent changes, really, in the, in the financial system, the banking system, don't allow, we, we don't know what the equilibrium looks like because we've never hit it. Uh, the, 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 there are various forces that encourage a strategy of what Talent calls you know, nickels in front of steamrollers. But the more finely people adjust the situation, probably means the more and more expertly they're making huge short odds bets that are going to come off every time for 10 years or 20 years or 30 years and then blood. And 20 years is that the limit probably uh, that we've seen over the last 300. But, uh, I certainly that. agree that even if we had a pure commodity currency, purely a commodity currency, as with the tulip mania and the South Sea bubble, money would rush in from outside. You wouldn't need to fake it. You wouldn't need to make it with fiat paper money. The mere fact that this seems to be such a scheme, a wizard scheme, something newfangled, South Seas, new invention, railways, canals, whatever it is, it's a real winner. And the money rushes in. And once, he, once we get that money escalator, like with house price rises, once, once you're making money because it makes money, the prices are going up because they're going up, people are buying in because the prices are going up, it won't last forever, perhaps. Although if it's a new invention, you might fool yourselves for longer. But, but even the shrewd old heads will say, yeah, 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 but I'll get out in time except that everyone's jammed in the exit trying to get out at the same time. And they don't. But uh, you're right, it can happen. I don't think it's quite so ruinous because the money doesn't disappear from the system. It, it, well, it goes back to foreign countries, perhaps. But, but it's not like now, when you, you can get a, a disappearance of money that was never anything but um, a, a bookkeeping, a digital, these days. It isn't. You know, someone borrows, you simply say, well, I'll this is your account. <laughs> You've got so much in it. Where'd that come from? We wrote it in. <laughs> That's it's yours. It's... Anyway, it balances something else in the account. It always balances, isn't it? But you're right, it can happen with a purely, just even just lumps of gold. You can get a mania, a, a, but it, I don't, it won't be as long lasting. It'll be, it'll spoil things. I'll try again. What will happen is, that there'll be a shift of money. Some fools and their money, they will be parted. Some have got out in time, some never went in, some have lent them money and got paid back before the thing collapsed. They'll have done okay. But everything of importance out there is still there. The roads, the canals, the skills, the capital. So it needn't be ruinous. What makes it ruinous is if all the prices are wrong and they just take time, hell of a time, much time as you like, in modern times, to get to get right, while everyone's searching for what they should be doing. In America, the, the people who were in house construction have got to do something else. And if you're a, if you're a carpenter in Nevada, it's difficult to flow into a job which isn't carpentry and is in another state. So it's a bit tricksy. And the Americans have extended um, unemployment benefit from 26 weeks to 99, wasn't it? And then the, there's the food stamps and the rest of it. So we have in America now. Um, unemployment going down because people are not bothering to declare themselves unemployed anymore. They're just, they're just not, uh, they're just not, haven't got a job. But they're getting by on various, various schemes. Yeah. Uh, you say it wouldn't be, it'd be difficult to uh, assess whether a bank is safe or not, but I assume in a, in a free economy we would uh, have, I don't know, magazines or rating agencies telling us, and, and we wouldn't be putting all our eggs in the same basket, you know, but, so I, I think there would be some element of safety. But my point was, uh, it's an answer to your question. Uh, yes, um, gold. Um, 
you want to protect yourself against uh, uh, banks. Normally, the theory is to buy gold, but the way I understand it, gold is a claim on a certain percentage of the world wealth, the world economy. World economy. <clears throat> if our governors and banks screw that up, <clears throat> it's not really worth much. Anyhow, if you have 1% oh. of the world economy and that collapses, you still have 1% of a collapsed economy. So what's the point of buying? Is that going to protect our liberty to buy gold? Well, there's, there's several answers to that. One is that when all else fails, people will take gold in payment because they, 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 know, they know they can use it for payment. So that there's that aspect to it. The trouble is, if things go that pear shaped, you'll have people, the state will simply come and do it all, and it will send around um, people with armbands and clubs to make sure that all the gold is rounded up, sadly. You know. Or they'll just come and kick your door and have it themselves. I, if it went really ugly, I, I fear, it needn't be that ugly. I mean, you hope there's a sort of, you hope it doesn't happen, but it will be genteel. So we'll respect each other's gold holdings and, and trade and everything will be less bad and the prices will be very different for a different set but you're right uh, because it, it wouldn't be spread throughout because some people will be desperate and because there'll be a government to look after their interests uh, it might just get all con just get confiscated that's the answer David? the other answer is yeah I mean right if the, if the world is wrecked by government and the first time the world in the world goes down, that's bad for everybody. But still, if you try and say with paper in the world in which the world is wrecked, you'll, you'll be even worse off. That's mm. it's a relief. Anything <laughs> <laughs> okay, with beans, guns. <laughs> is there any other questions? Well, a couple of comments. Uh, maybe <clears throat> one I, I disagree with Kevin Dowd and uh, ah. other people, who, uh, Sean Gabb, for instance, who um, are against limited liability companies or limited liability banks. And the reason is that if the capital of a bank is the net worth of the partners and directors, how do I know that? So they would have to disclose, well, I have a house here, I have a land, a piece of land there, I have a couple of Rembrandts uh, on my walls, I have a Buick or you know, whatever, Bentley in my garage, and my wife has jewelry, and you know, this sort of thing, which is absurd. So uh, it's much better to have a balance sheet which says capital, you know, 20 billion or 20 million, and, and you know what it is. Uh, so you can make a judgment whether you want to lend them money or you want to trade with them and, uh, and so on. So that's one aspect. Um, the other aspect regarding a gold standard and speculation which you described, you know, people buying and because it goes up then you want to buy more and then so on the reverse of what happens for a uh, commodity market. Um, if you have a gold standard people who are buying have to pay in gold. So they have less gold to buy tulips or uh, you know, shares or uh, other commodities and, and so on. It costs them to speculate. Whereas people at Goldman Sachs, when they speculate on something, they don't put up their money they get money from the Fed to speculate. So there is a big difference. Mm. Famously, for instance, during the tulip bubble in, uh, in the Netherlands in the 17th century, uh, people sold their house in order to buy their house, in order to uh, buy tulips, uh, tulip bubble, uh, tulip uh, onions. So um, that is, I think, a check on the amplitude of speculative movements on the size of bubbles. I think you're right. Also, the price of other things will go down if the money was flowing yeah, in. Right. Yeah, then it might be worth buying those instead of, at least it'd be a safer bet. That, exactly. that may stop going up. But if you buy these, whatever it is, commodities, mm. and store them, yeah. Paul? Yeah, um, I just want to say a couple of things on the, the, the alleged fraudulence of fractional reserve banking. So in your talk, you seem to suggest that 
the only thing that you could see more or less was fraudulent with it was that people perhaps weren't, it wasn't made explicitly clear to the depositors that they were depositing a fractional reserve bank. Now, this is certainly true. It, there is a trick going on. Um, and people are, you know, a lot of people are in the dark. We might all know in theory. It's not, certainly not explicit in any kind of contract. That is true. But it's, it's more than that. Um, it wouldn't be fraudulent if you said, this is an investment bank. I will be lending your money out. These are the people. You know, there are these timescales in which you can claim it back. If everything was absolutely open and above board. But that's not, but that isn't fractional reserve banking. That's in placing your money in an investment company. Fractional reserve banking. Is, it relies on this trick, but it relies on other tricks as well. You, I've got my uh, couple of pounds of gold in, con, in very conservative, responsible bank X, and my next door neighbour has got his couple of pounds of gold in, fly by night, lend it to God knows who, quick, quick return. But they're both, on the balance sheets of our assets, they're both classed as the same amount of pounds of gold. So the risk of where, which bank it's in and is all covered up by fractional reserve banking. It, it, it lends entire opacity to the whole system. That's what fractional reserve banking is. If you strip away all the lies, it isn't any fractional reserve bank anymore. It's a quite clearly explicit, yes, I've got this money. It's clearly invested in this bank. We know the reputation of this bank. It's governed by these contracts. But that isn't fractional reserve banking. That's open and honest investment. Fractional reserve banking, as it operates, and even by that name, is intrinsically a fraud. Uh, I don't. I don't disagree. When, it, especially when it's coupled with lender of last resort. Yeah, and uh, all the other. I mean, that's just too, absolutely yeah, that's too right. big to fail. Yeah, and yeah. and I'm sure there are all sorts of other reasons. Oh, all sorts of perverse incentives yeah. were, were built in because of that. Yeah. Well, yeah, but the problem with fractional reserve banking is it's it's not what, what Paul describes is a hedge fund or a fund that is able to borrow in order to increase uh, its. Uh, uh, trading uh, position. What fractional reserve banking does is that it multiplies the amount of money in circulation because when you deposit money in a bank, it lends that you know the that banks will lend that money to another bank, which would lend that money to another bank, and you have a multi multiply multiplying factor, and that is a problem because one dollar sort of deposited in a bank creates twenty, thirty dollars at the end of a circuit. There's twenty, thirty dollars of people owing money to match that. It, it's only a problem if, if that thirty number changes. If no. that thirty number stays at thirty, it doesn't matter. No, and you're wrong. I'll, I'll tell you why. <laughs> <laughs> so first of all Paul and then Jan and then Paul again. So it's uh, Paul first of all. But, yeah, and then, I'm working in the museum and I have to explain what does it for 18 years to put a tunnel under the tent and 18 years to complete the clip and suspension bit. In view of that being the same amount that oh, 18 years as the bill and bus time, do people know other reasons why this is so important? Ah. There are those who argue that it's all land. I've heard that argument. It's it's really a land price speculation. So usually the Georgists come in here, they, they couple it with that. Um, well, certainly Brunel, um, he was good at getting things to the House of Commons. It, it's, it's a shame it had to be done that way, but he was good at it. Uh, you, had to, you couldn't have a company without a, an Act of Parliament, I believe, in those days. Um, so he had to do that. And he, he spoke a good scheme, and he built very well, uh, but not all of his stuff made money. Sadly, but it was great to look at. He wasn't so keen on economics of Brunel. Yeah. But um, 18 years. Well, the tunnel never made, uh, ended up being... Well, it, it's all right now. It's used for the tube. Um, this is the Brunel. Brunel's father started it, and Brunel the younger eventually nearly drowned in it. And, uh, yeah, that, that, that's... That kind of work. But um, <coughs> some of these things don't matter. The atmospheric railway didn't make any money down there. Dawlish, where it was. The Great Western Railway was okay. The Great Eastern was a failure, though a magnificent failure. Yeah. This, the father was much better in economics, actually, than the son. It's the, I should have said, said John Brunel earlier. Uh, yeah. National um, Reserve. Well, again, I think without a government, 
And I think there will be a clearinghouse system, and banks do tend to learn about each other, and they will see what's passing through from this bank compared to that bank, and that might give them a clue, and now is the time to start having goal of things. So that, that, might, that might help. Um, I don't argue for... I, my, my, it's a kind of negative argument. I say it might be OK. It might even be um, non-fraudulent and no matter of immorality. But what's, where's the benefit? I can't see a benefit. That's, that's the, I can see a benefit from lots of, lots of um, people who haven't got the time to buy shares and oversee them. So they put money into a bank, which lends them out to all sorts of things. They can't all fail at once. You hope that you'll fail at once. <laughs> and so it's generally safer. And it hasn't, they don't have to oversee each little one and get in and out and buy and sell. And the, in, in effect, the bank... And especially with, if, you, if you invest in a company, it might lie to you. But somebody who borrows from a bank has to pay the interest. So the, they can't lie about that. They just do. And then the, the bank, after a cut, passes it back to you. So, so you get interest, which in a, in a sense is... Um, is less fuss and dividend. It may not be as good, it may not be as high, but it's a way of you investing. Now, admittedly, you're not told this is what's going on. You know, your money is safe with us, your money is in the, see these big vaults, <laughs> so your money can't be stolen. It isn't in there. But I think with the libertarian system, it would be far more obvious. John? If we have competing money supplies, Uh, then it'll be revealed that there's a benefit or not money because uh, presumably unless you are actually keeping quiet the fact that you've got a fractional reserve system or what it is I mean there might be fraud if you don't tell people you've got fractional reserve but if you say we do have fractional reserve this is our ratio we change it under such and such circumstances we're independently scrutinized by such and such a body and then somebody talks with you I can't see how fraud can get into that system but uh, the only real way to tell whether it is ultimately economic is simply allow there to be real competition between systems and see which people opt for. Paul? Yeah, um, the David's point that the, the, only, the only variable is the, um, is the, uh, the rate, base rate. It's not as well, it's, it's the risk activity, it's the risk profiles of the various banks. You have a lot of people invested in Northern Rock. And if all of a sudden there's a run on the bank and it can't pay its depositors, or the, you know, they put it all lent out and all the people they've lent it to default and don't pay it back to you, that is a, that is a problem. It's more, than, it's, it's more of a problem than just, you know, because the, 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 all of a sudden you've got people who are land that this is, this is their money to save thousand that they, they're not getting it back. Well, that's true of capitalism in general. Right. Yeah, but, well, it's, it's fine, it's it's fine. Yes, but, it's, but, it's, but they only right, got that money. Safe. They only got that money because the fraud, once you take all the fraud away, right. it's no longer a fractional reserve banking. It's open and honest investment and competing practices. Fraud is a different issue. My point was the inflationary problem only arises if the reserve ratio changes and in a free market and a fixed base money, such as gold, a bank cannot effectively say we're going to have a reserve ratio of a half percent rather than two percent if the market has determined two percent. You can't do it any more than I can't charge a much higher price than the market price for my labour. Then you will buy it. Christian, and you, Christian? Yeah, I. I wonder if we are not confusing two things. I mean, if I borrowed, banks don't invest. That's not their main activity. They lend money. Yeah. And when you have a fractional reserve banking, uh, you have you, the bank starts its business not by getting deposits, but by lending the capital of its shareholders. Yeah. So it lends it to a number of people and so on. And then it goes over the capital that was originally uh, put up by the shareholders because it actually creates money. So um, what happens is that the people who are getting that money are then depositing that money with other banks because you borrow to buy a car, so you uh, pay the car dealer, the car dealer deposits that money in another bank. That other bank then will lend that money in turn. It's very different from someone who is borrowing money in order to buy assets, whether someone who is taking mortgage in order to buy a house 
or a hedge fund who is borrowing three, four times its capital in order to buy gold or to buy shares or uh, commodities. So the system, therefore, becomes very unstable. And that's a problem with fractional reserve banking, is that the whole system becomes in unstable. Because the money that the car dealer is deposited with its bank, is depositing with its bank, is not money that was, I mean, it's, it's, it was money that was created by the original bank. And then that bank will create more money, the bank of the car dealer, will create more money when it lends to other people who are then buying things and, and so on. I, I think I see a reconciliation here that if we've been living with this system and it's got up to whatever ratio it is or down to whatever ratio it is and it just pretty much stays there, that seemed okay. But, you're, but if, if, as you say, suddenly, for whatever reason, more banks start up, particularly people are wealthier or money comes, from, money comes in from abroad because it sort of looks like a good place to invest, so lots of banks start up and they start lending out, they lend more than their capital or a certain ratio to compare to it, then we can get a kind of concertina or wave and we'll get seasick as a result. So it, it isn't neatly here. It's some down there, some up there. Absolutely. And, and it is irrespective of whether the ratio that the bank use capital to assets changes or doesn't change. It's unstable simply because there is that money which goes to other people yeah. and to other banks, and no one knows what are the assets. It is inflation, in fact. Inflation well, makes it, it unstable. Right. It creates, inflation is fraud. It, it, it creates inflation because it, it's money that is created and you can't control the amount of money that is being created without changing. I'm not sure how much call it fraud. I, I don't think it's helpful or to be, to be welcomed if, 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 it, if, it, if it lurches in, around in an unpredictable manner. In, in, a, in a true free market, each firm will create his own money. And so if a bank creates more money than the others, that currency would be devalued. So it's not, what Christian says is one thing, but he assume it is the same money for every bank. But in a true free market, each bank could create its own currency, its own money. And therefore, if a bank has a higher fractional reserve ratio than the others, immediately this money would be devalued. And I think that would be what regulates the market. Well, I, I, I don't think, I mean, money, like language, wants to be universal. I mean, I, I don't want to be paid in you know, money of uh, bank uh, so-and-so, because who is going to accept that money? We're talking about different notes with the same base. I mean, the assumption here is a free market with a base of gold or silver. Oh, or whatever. fine, yes. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. But then you'll still have different banks which will issue their own notes. Of course. Well, and if a bank overextends its ratio, its notes will be devalued. People won't touch them. That's what the free market does. Surely. Well, they are warehouse receipts for for gold, and, for uh, gold. Or, or gold or, or, or whatever. But I think but, that at the end of the day, in a free market in the world, you would have two free currencies and one, I think. and and maybe small, you know, local regional currencies like you have credit cards. I mean, I'm not using, uh, you know, credit cards. That people don't accept. That's the payment mechanism. Though. Yeah, but that is what that is what money is about. No. Payment mechanism. No, no, no. Yes, it is payment. I think we would have um, world branch banking. I mean, it must be uh, remembered that in the 1930s, no Canadian bank failed, and thousands of banks failed in in the US, mm. and uh, and America wouldn't permit branch banking or interstate banks. Some, but it was a it was a privilege or it was licensed or it was restricted. And so when, when it was just, if it was just mostly farmers in a bank and the crop failed or business was bad or export prices fell, the bank, the bank went under. And so I, I imagine with world branch banks and there might be only eight, eight major banks in the world, besides like tens of thousands of branches, that may be no, no bad thing. There, there will be a clearinghouse system and I, I think that would help them keep an eye on each other. Different banks. Yeah. It's not currency. Yeah, yeah. So um, we'll continue this over. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what was you going to say, Jeremy? You completely waived it. Okay. Is there anyone, anyone else want to speak?
Oh, thank you very much indeed, Bob. Thank you.